I can thank myself for bringing, I've got um, students here from um, EM Normandy, Adventure yeah. Initiation, Entrepreneurship, Small Business Management, and um, Business Plan Development. I'd also like to thank the ELAB staff that made all this happen, and um, Elizabeth Jovanoska, who is the Associate Director of the ELAB. When I started doing these things 16 years ago as an adjunct, I spent the whole night not even sleep before, have to do all these name tags, everything myself, and my dream was just to be able to show up at the start and be able to leave at the end, and the ELAB staff has, has made that possible, coming in and you know, putting, putting together everything. So thanks to, to them. Um, and of course, uh, thank our, our keynote speaker, Ted Corcus, who I'll introduce briefly, just to give you a quick background. I'm um, Bruce Bach and I, were so my full-time job here is I'm a clinical professor of management. That's where most of our entrepreneurship courses are in the management department. I'm also the executive director of the entrepreneurship lab and run the entrepreneurship programs. I'm not a, a typical academic. I came from a, a bunch of different stuff, starting on Wall Street, starting a couple of companies in the US and overseas. I'd say for entrepreneurship, I look at it much more as a, a mindset than just starting a business. Like a startup is an important manifestation of entrepreneurship, but it's so much broader. So whether you want to work at a startup, work, um, start your own company, work at a service provider for startups, you know, small business lending, finance law, whatever, or work at a larger firm with an entrepreneurial mindset, you know, that idea of being able to, to add value by solving problems and creating benefits is, uh, to me, what's the most important. So whether you're, you know, uh, a professor working in government in any area, being able to think entrepreneurially, I thought I'd share this as a, a term. I, I went to school in Japan before. I, I actually went to Pace to study international management. I was the first student in that area. And came in from Japan, and I just wanted to read this quick quote. There's a, a concept called Ichigo Ichie. Um, it's just four Japanese characters that describes the cultural concept of treasuring meetings with people. I'm just reading it. It's just a paragraph from Wikipedia. The term is often translated as, quote, for this time only, or never again, or one chance in a lifetime. The term reminds people to cherish any gathering that they may take part in, citing the fact that many meetings in life are not repeated. Even when the same group of people can get together again, a particular gathering will never be replicated. And thus, each moment is always once in a lifetime. Um, I was reminded of this when I saw the Anthony Bourdain special where he was in Japan visiting Masa, you know, from Masa's restaurant, and he just talked about that warmth that, you know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, so, you know, try to, to do something with that. We, we have um, a, a group of students from EM Normandy in France that part of their education is to do a, uh, an internship, so. They'll be interested, and now they're glad they're here. I promised them good food, and, and we're also delivering a, uh, an internship possibility. Let me um, introduce our, our keynote speaker. You, you have this in the, the back of your program, but, but let me read it to you. Um, Ted Corcus is the CEO and Chief Strategist of ProPhase Labs. Um, Ted is an entrepreneur and a business leader who has financed, taken public via IPOs and reverse um, mergers turned around and scaled numerous high growth um, development stage companies. Ted began his career on Wall Street and then established uh, Forrester Financial and Management Consulting Firm. Ted financed and advised ID Biomedical, a biotech vaccine company headed for bankruptcy with a $25 million valuation. Seven years later, the company was sold to GlaxoSmithKline for more than $1.4 billion. Initially an investor, Ted witnessed several years of declining revenues and increasing losses at Prophase Labs, a NASDAQ listed company with the symbol PRPH. In 2009, Ted initiated an extremely risky but highly successful proxy contest which led to his control. As CEO, he restructured and streamlined all operations. This resulted in another successful turnaround. In 2017, Prophase sold 
the Coldies Remedy brand for $50 million to Mylon, a multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical company. Ted is now strategically taking Prophase Labs in new directions with more to come. Outside of business, Ted is uh, an involved father and basketball coach. He is also passionate about helping young entrepreneurs. He graduated magna cum laude from Tufts University and Beta Gamma Sigma from Columbia Business School. And with that, I'd like to welcome Ted. Thank you, Bruce, so much for inviting me here today. Um, Bruce didn't want me to put a lot of slides up here. Frankly, if somebody ever comes to my office and wants to pitch me, the first thing I ask them is how many slides. And if they tell me not 40 slides, 50 slides, I say, show me your six best slides because I got ADHD and that's it, that's all I'm going to look at. I don't know if I really do what my family says I do. I don't think I do, but that's my excuse. So um, I, have a, only, I have only about eight slides here. Um, any one of these slides I could talk about for 30 or 60 minutes. Bruce said I got about four or five minutes per slide. So I'm going to go through this really fast. Some of the things I'm not going to talk about. Uh, stock market. I have an enormous amount of experience in the stock market, which I put up against anybody. But it's not a part of this presentation. I don't really consider that entrepreneurial. But in the Q&A, anything you want to ask me, I'm happy to discuss. It's up to you guys if you ask me questions. If you don't, we'll just go through the presentation. Um, I gotta go to the first slide. Is that what you're doing? Here we go. Yeah. So, um, this really, I'm gonna get into my background in a second, but I have this question, which is why am I here today? And at one point I was where all of you were sitting. And yet, how did I get here from the point of view that Bruce invited me? So how did I achieve the level of success to get to this point where I'm standing here today? The other way to ask the question is, why do I want to be here today? I'm not getting paid to be here. Uh, I don't expect to do business with anybody in the room, you know, unless you guys go to and say, oh, I want an internship and all that stuff. I'll say, no, 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 I don't have, you know, whatever. So why am I here? And I hope during the course of this presentation, some of these answers will become apparent to you why I'm here today. Because the reason I'm here today is what's made me successful. Um, and interestingly, Bruce said to me before this started, a, few, a little while ago, he said he was writing something called The Accidental Entrepreneur. And it just clicked with me. Because everything I did was sort of accidental. None of it was planned. And yet here I am. So I'm going to go into uh, my background. This is me, by the way. All right? Might, might relate to some of you. This is a really long time ago, but it goes by like that. And if you notice, I have a bottle of beer in both hands. So I have to swear all of you to secrecy. I just thought it was now. Uh, if I ever get nominated to the Supreme Court, you have to swear you didn't see this button, all right? I'm sorry, it's a really bad joke. And I'm not going to talk politics, though. Um, all right. So I assume that the reason I have this photo here has nothing to do with my background, except right DNA to lead. Maybe this looks like I'm a leader here. I actually did a really cool um, one day event uh, at the NTC National Training Center. I'm not here to talk about that at all. But I had a, I had a blast of driving around and shooting, you know, machine guns and all that kind of stuff. Um, my background. Um, I'm going to try and do this really quickly. Um, and I'm really not sure where to start because normally I talk about my background with somebody I'll go on for hours, as Bruce was, uh, was doing. I mean, he didn't even get through half of his background and we were talking for 15 minutes. I'll do this in four minutes. Um, Wow, I really didn't have a lot of direction growing up. My parents were divorced. All my father said to me was, I tell I want you to be happy. My mother was doing a whole bunch of other things, and I just kind of found my own way. Um, I always thought if I did well in school, it would lead to a, a good resume and a good job. Uh, I went to undergraduate school and went back and lived at home, fooled around. And one day I said, you know, all through college I want to be a lawyer. So it came time to take the LSATs. I want to take the LSATs. It was all about... Um, Reading, writing, research. I'm like, I'm not into reading, writing, research. I didn't like studying for the LSAT. I'm not going to be a lawyer. All of a sudden, my whole career changed because I didn't want to take the LSAT. So I said, what about the GMAT? GMAT, it's all about logic and math. And I'm like, wow, I'm really good at that. And the reason I'm telling you this right now is because the next slide, I'm going to talk about how people are wired. I was wired for business, and I didn't even know it. So I took the GMAT. I went to Columbia Business School. Um, and I found myself in Columbia Business School investing in companies. 
I spent very little time going to class. I probably shouldn't say that to a bunch of universities since I didn't go to class, all right? But I made sure I got good grades, and that's a whole other story. But I remember back in the days, there wasn't the internet and there wasn't um, stock charts. I made my own stock charts. I would invest in companies, and I would literally get graph paper, and every day I would look at the trading range and the volume, and I would mark it down on each stock. And I used to have these sheets of paper. And I just, nobody told me to do this. I just naturally did it, and I had fun doing it. So since the time I was in college or graduate school, I've been investing in stocks, I've been investing in companies. So after you know, Columbia Business School, it's like, oh, I gotta go get a job. All these people are wearing suits and ties and reading Wall Street journals. And I'm like, I'm not into any of that, but I gotta get a job on Wall Street. So I went to an interview and I got a job as an institutional equity salesman. I worked in an investment bank. I'm not gonna go into all that. I never enjoyed what I was doing. I made money. I was a salesman. I'm good at being a salesman. I'm wired to be a salesman, but I was never wired to work on Wall Street and wear a suit and tie and answer people and all that stuff. And um, so I was never happy there. So I was always kind of investing on the side. And so one of the things I did when I was investing in companies um, was I would tell friends about the, com the companies that I was investing in. They would invest too. I had no ulterior motives. I wasn't collecting commissions from any of these people. I had no reason to do it, much like I have no reason for being here today. And yet, I like building goodwill with people. Um, and that's why I'm here today. I like sharing what I've learned. That's it. That's why I'm here. That's what I did with my friends. So they started investing in the same companies I did. I get involved in these small cap development stage companies. And I would invest. They would invest. And before you know it, uh, we would have these big positions in these little companies. And all of a sudden, these managements that, don't answer, that wouldn't answer my telephone calls all of a sudden started answering my phone calls. All of a sudden, I became important to the managements of these companies because I was buying a lot of stock from all my friends. And all of a sudden, I built a network of people that were buying stocks in these little companies. And all of a sudden, I got to know managements. And from getting to know managements, I started to get to know companies. The first thing you're going to learn in business as you go through all of this is virtually every, every company has a CEO who is really optimistic and positive about their company. You will never find a public company on this planet where the CEO doesn't say, I have the greatest company in our stocks and they go through the roof. And what you find out after you invest it's not until you have a big position you can't get out that you learn about all the skeletons, you, you learn about all the things that go wrong with these companies. And that's the point where I started helping the companies do better. Not because I want to collect the commission and help raise money for these companies, I'd do whatever I had to because I had a big investment and all my friends had big investments. And so because of that, I had to help the company succeed. So there are two companies in particular I got involved with um, in the late 1990s. One was ID Biomedical, it was a biotech company. Um, that had a gene detection technology. Um, it was a little company, they were based in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, and so I became an investor. Somebody gave me a stock tip, you know, they thought I was gonna buy 10,000 shares of this little dollar and a half stock. Next thing you know, between uh, me and my friends, we had a network of people, we bought five million shares. Don't, I mean, it's crazy, I had a stock tip, I was like nuts. So uh, there were about 13 million shares outstanding, and um, this is a company that was going bankrupt. It was going bankrupt because the CEO had done an IPO, I think, with Merrill Lynch several years earlier, raised $30 million, and they were burning through all the money. And they just assumed that they were going to raise more money every time. And he wasn't doing anything to create sponsorship in his stock. He wasn't doing anything to uh, generate revenues and earnings. They were just burning through all the money, and they were going to go bankrupt. I was like, oh my god, I have to do something here. So um, I literally forced the CEO out of the company because they found somebody up in Canada that was connected to about 3 million shares. So between us, we had 8 million shares of a 13 million share company. And I forced two people underneath the CEO to be promoted. And they got it. They started creating sponsorship. I helped them raise money. And it went from this little stock to a higher price stock. They raised uh, a larger block of money, and then they made an acquisition. That acquisition was a flu vaccine um, which they purchased for about $100 million. A few years later, they sold it for $1.4 billion. This is a company that became hugely successful, having nothing to do with what the company was doing when I became an investor. And, and to be honest with you, I got out of the company long before it sold for $1.4 billion, and I didn't make all these hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I, but, you know, that's, that's another story. The other company I got involved with, with which is now called Profane's Labs, called Quigley Corporation. And uh, I'm sorry we're running over, but I'll be done with the background real fast. Um, but this is important. They had a product called Cold Ease, Cold Rem. And it all started in 1992 when there was a study on zinc gluconate glycine lozenges that showed that they shortened the duration of the common cold by 42%. So in 96, 
they branded the product um, Coldies. The founder of the company um, cut a licensing deal with two scientists. One had a use patent, the other had a formulation patent. And they took the product to the Cleveland Clinic, who did another study that showed the same great results. Got an enormous amount of free press around the country for a year. A little company in Pennsylvania finds a cure for chemical. Everybody was looking to buy Coldies, and everybody was buying the stock. So I was an investor. I got more involved. Um, and in fact, I ended up cutting the deal. And this is going to get into a slide later on about thinking big. And I thought big. And I convinced them to give me a large block of options where they needed money. I exercised the options. They got a large block of money. The stock took off. We all made a lot of money. Everybody's happy. So that's sort of my background when it was called the Quigley Corporation. Um, later on, we're going to get into when it became Prophase Labs. Um, I'll just say uh, this with regards to my background. Fast forward about 10 years later, this is now 2009, I didn't like the direction of the company. I was involved again. There were all sorts of promises made that weren't coming true. I launched what's called the proxy contest. If any of you are interested, I'll go into that in the Q&A. But I launched a proxy contest where um, I basically nominated my own board of directors to go up against the existing. Every year with uh, public companies, you have a shareholders meeting where you vote on board of directors. Typically, you don't have a choice for your board of directors. There's just one board of directors. You don't even vote. If you don't vote, the votes are automatically cast in favor of the board of directors. So I nominated a board. And because of all the people I had put into the stock, my board won. All of a sudden, I became CEO. I never expected to be a CEO. I didn't want to be a CEO. But I was just going to break up and sell the company. But after winning control of the company, I found out that most of the value wasn't there which is another story which maybe I'll get into later. So that's how I became CEO in 2009. I had to go about turning around a company that was also going back. So, uh, critically important. I actually just did one of my first speaking events a couple of weeks ago at an entrepreneurial uh, event. with, And I thought I was going to be talking to young entrepreneurs. And it turned out it was entrepreneurs that were anywhere from 30 to 70 years old. And these 15 or 20 people were sitting around in a room listening to me speak. I'm like, why are you listening to me speak? You all have your own experience. I assume you're probably here just to network with each other. And I got into talking about a number of things. Invariably, virtually every single person did not know how to manage people. And so they all wanted to know what my secret was. And that's really interesting. These are people that have been entrepreneurs for decades, and they don't know how to manage people. Because people that are wired to be entrepreneurs and think a certain way, they think that your product or your service that you've developed is the end all be all and is the reason why your company exists. That only counts for a small part of being successful. We'll get into that a little more later. But one of the critical things is understanding how people are wired. Everybody is wired differently. Everybody has strengths and weaknesses. Nobody can do everything. Perfect example. Malachi comes over, Malachi and Eugene come over and introduce themselves to me. Bruce says, Malachi, he's a, he's a natural born salesman. First thing you do, I meet him, I'm like, this guy is a salesman. It's not by accident. Nobody told him to be a salesman. He is wired to be a salesman. All right? If you assess people, I do something, I will not interview anybody without first giving them, uh, my management consultant will, will give you a personality, I call it a personality assessment, she doesn't like the word personality. It's a bunch of touchy-feely questions. Not asking you how you feel about things, how you feel in groups of people, and so forth. It's about, it takes about 45 minutes, and it's uncannily accurate. People that I've worked with for eight years, I've gone back and looked at their assessment from eight years ago, and I'm like, oh my god, this describes this person to a T. Malachi, I'm telling you, he's a salesperson. I can tell you right now what his assessment is going to look like before he even takes it, because you know right up. He's a salesman. So everybody is wired different. So I, the reason I chose these two pictures, Tom Brady. And I, listen, uh, I gotta give it to the Patriots, even though I'm a New Yorker. You know, I gotta give it to the Patriots. Pretty good. Brady is a great quarterback. Gronkowski is a great tight end. Would you put Gronkowski at quarterback? Of course not. Would you put Brady at tight end? Of course not. Two of the greatest football players today. But if you put them in the wrong position, they would be atrociously bad. It's the same thing with managing people. Same thing with basketball players. Would, would you put Michael Jordan at center? Of course you would. Would you, would you put Will Chamberlain uh, at point guard, bring the ball up? Of course not. The ball would be stealing from him. He scored 100 points in the game. It's the same thing with managing people. Everybody is wired differently. Everybody has strengths and weaknesses. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I'm wired to be a salesman. Um, there's something called DISC. That's a part of the assessment. 
D stands for dominance, I stands for interpersonal skills, I tend to score high in D and I, I score low in S and C, S and C has to do with steadiness and consistency. So my chief accounting officer, she scores high in S and C, she scores low in D and I, I score high in D and I, I score low in S and C. Uh, my chief accounting officer, I can do math really well. I can do her job, but I should not be a chief accounting officer. I don't like to follow rules. I'm the last person in the world in a public company to be a chief accounting officer. If I'm driving down the street and there's a bunch of traffic, I, I shouldn't admit this, but if I, I'm really in a hurry and I think I can get away with going in the right lane, you know, or in the shoulder for, you know, real quick, I'm going to do it. In a million years, she's not driving in the right shoulder because we're just wired differently. She's wired to be a chief accounting officer, and I'm not. So I suggest to all of you to think about what your strengths and weaknesses are, what comes naturally to you. It doesn't mean you can't adapt. I could have adapted. I made money when I, when I worked on Wall Street. When I was a salesman, I made money. I didn't enjoy it. I never had a passion for what I was doing. And if you don't have a passion for what you're doing, it's just a job and you're not going to be as successful as you could be. So I recommend to all of you, figure out who you are and go in the direction of what your strengths are. In terms of managing other people, it's exactly the same thing. I will not interview somebody until they take the assessment first and do an interview with my management consultant. In addition to that, even before that step, the first thing you have to do is put together a list of responsibilities for the job. It's interesting if me and two other senior employees are looking to hire somebody, you'd be surprised. It could take a couple of weeks before we all agree on what the important responsibilities are, what the important strengths are of the person we're looking for. Once you get that down, then you do an assessment. You only interview people whose assessment strengths and weaknesses fit the responsibilities. At that point, then if I interview somebody, if I like them, I can hire them. But if I like somebody before going through that process, what good is it? I'm, I, just because I like somebody doesn't mean they're good for the job. So that's a little bit about management. It's critically important. If you're going to build a company, how you manage employees. All right, marketing. Now, I don't know if Bruce really wanted me to, to get into marketing today, but believe it or, mark, or not, any business, whether it's a product or service, if you're going to start a business, I assume you're going to be selling something to somebody. You're going to want to generate revenues, all right? So how do you generate revenues? How do you sell to somebody? So the first thing you have to do is know your customer. Um, and knowing your customer means figuring out who's going to buy your product or service. How do you do that? I do focus groups. I used to think focus groups are bullshit. And you can cut out bullshit if you want to. Um, I used to think it was bullshit. You're going to have eight people sitting around talking about your product behind you know, a, a two-way mirror. You're not going to learn anything. It turns out it's amazing how much you can learn from eight or ten people if they're your target consumer. It's amazing how much you can learn about them. The other thing I do is I do online surveys of our target customers. So figure out who your target customer is. Do research to find out what they like. Because believe it or not, the people that are buying your product or your service think differently than you do. The biggest mistake people make is they just assume that people think like you do. Anybody can have a good idea. My company, I had somebody right out of college who had better creative ideas for coldies than I did. I listened to her before I listened to myself. So think about what other people are going to like and dislike about your product, but then go out and talk to them about it, either through focus groups, online surveys, learn what your target consumer is going to respond to. What you're going to respond to may be very different from what they're going to respond to. Once you know what they're going to respond to, and you figure out all your claims and all that, all that good stuff, um, you have to tell a story. Um, when you want to market, you have to have an effective message. If you don't have an effective message, then it doesn't matter. The message, that ad, whatever it is, you could uh, distribute it to you know, for a billion impressions, five billion impressions. If it's not effective, just you're going to spend all this money, you're not going to get any traction. So the first thing that have, has to happen is it has to be effective, which is, you know, based on some of the things I just described to you. Once you have an effective message, then you have to distribute it efficiently. No big advertising agency is ever going to tell you what I just told you just now. And I learned this from spending millions of dollars and wasting millions of dollars in advertising. I figured it out myself. When I took over control of my company, I, I literally started from scratch. I fired virtually everybody in the company. I fired all the vendors, all the consultants. I decided, you know, it's funny, in college I thought uh, marketing was kind of BS. I was a finance major. And now marketing to me is 
just fantastic. I love marketing. It's, it's the most fun thing that I do, uh, certainly when I had, had uh, Coldy. So, uh, very important to have an effective message and then distribute it efficiently. What does efficiently mean? How many people are you reaching in your target market and what's it costing to reach them? So I found a really cool way to reach a lot of people on TV. Um, there's something called CPM. It's probably the most important term in marketing. All it means is cost per thousand. What does it cost to reach a thousand people? So typically ad agencies might tell you it costs 15 or $20 a CPM to reach people, reach your target. I had this one ad agency that said, we can do it for $10. I'm like, $10, great. And then I learned something called remnant <coughs> advertising, where you don't get to lock in what time slot, you don't get to lock in the, the TV station or the program, it's more random, but um, it guarantees that you're gonna reach X number of people for a $4 CPM, and I got it down to a $2 CPM. So all of a sudden, I'm reaching 1,000 people for $2, instead of an ad agency for which it was gonna cost $10. So for $2, I thought, it doesn't matter if I'm reaching my target market or not. It makes no difference at all because I know they're going to be more, if I reach a thousand people at two dollars, I know that more than a couple hundred of them are going to be in my target market anyway, and it's going to cost me less than just reaching the two people, the 200 people um, um, by, by paying more and, and just focusing on the target market. So I might have just jumped around there a little bit, but the point is you have to pay attention. You have to have an effective message and then you have to distribute that effective message efficiently. That effective message, it's all about telling a story. I don't care if it's a product or service, I don't care if you're selling direct to somebody. When you approach somebody, the best way to approach them is to describe a problem that they have. And then you introduce your product or your service, and that's your solution. So you start with a problem, and what's interesting, um, when I first started doing this, I produced six 60 second TV commercials. And I then went to this firm to test all of them. We tested every scene and every commercial. They explained to me it cost $25,000 to have them test the commercials. So this $25,000 lesson I'm giving to you for free right now. Your um, message, your, whether it's a TV commercial or whether it's a pitch in an email, has to tell a story. It starts with expressing the problem. When we tested, people hate seeing the problem. Like for us, it was showing people they're sick. Nobody likes to see sick people, but you guys show it on the TV screen for a split second, show them sick, and then immediately introduce the hero product. In this case, it was Coldies. Explain what the product does, how it works, then you show the people well. So you have a problem, you have a solution, and then you show the solution at work with the people well, and then somebody comes on and guarantees the product and stands behind the product. And um, what's interesting, when we did the six 60 second uh, commercials, I actually had a salesman that said, Ted, we love you, but what are you doing in the commercial? You're going to mess up our business. I said, if I don't test well, we'll pull it out. Now, I was no actor. In fact, what you're going to see is an early one that got a little bit better. I'm pretty bad at this one. But it still worked. It was still effective out, out of six 60-second spots. So we're talking about hundreds of seeds. We tested every one. The only ones that tested off the charts were the scientific animation, explaining how the product worked, and me coming on and guaranteeing. And I have no ego here, it wasn't me, it's because I was the CEO of a company standing behind the product and it meant a lot. So I'm gonna show you 30 second commercial now, where not only do I accomplish all of this in the 30 second commercial, but in addition to that, I also introduced a new product because everybody knew about our Coldies lozenges, they didn't know about our gummies, so we introduced the gummies too. And I was able to accomplish all of this in 30 seconds and after a while we were able to do 15 seconds where we accomplished all of this. So when you see a TV commercial, this may not, seem like anything to you, but an enormous amount of thought and work went into this. And the bottom line is, I took a brand that was going like this, and when a brand is going like this, and we're on a shelf, it's going like this the first two years, I met with retailers. We have a convention that I would go to every year called ECRM, where I would meet with 70 retailers over four days, 20 minute meeting, boom, 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 and I just started the business. And I'd meet with these retailers, meet with Walgreens, and Walmart, and CVS, and write it. And they all said the same thing. Ted, love your passion, love your enthusiasm. I said, I'm going to turn this brand around. We're going to pump a lot of money into it. They're like, that's great. But your sales are like this, so you have to take a product off the shelf. And I'm like, wait, 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 don't take the product off the shelf. And like, maybe we'd have four or five facings, and all of a sudden now we'd have three facings. And what happens is if you start taking facings off the shelf, you have less visibility. And a lot of consumers, they make up their mind when they're walking down the aisle. If they walk down the aisle, they see, don't see your product. They're not going to purchase your product. So what happens when your sales are dropping, they're kicking products off the shelf. As they kick products off the shelf, you have less visibility and your, your products drop further. So it becomes a downward cycle. I had to turn around that cycle. So I had to pump a lot of money. 
make a long story short, our biggest competitor was five times our size when I got done several years later. They were only three and a half times our size, even though their budget was at least five times our budget. How did I do it? Low cost, low CPMs with an effective message. And so when I sold this brand last year for $50 million, which everybody thought was worthless, I was able to do that. I did a online survey which showed that our brand awareness was just as strong as the brand that, was, that used to be five times our size. And I did it with 20% of their budget. So I'm gonna show you this spot now that I explained all that. Just for fun, we'll see if it... Cold these lozenges are clinically proven to shorten your cold. Cold these zinc ions released in your mouth inhibit the cold virus from replicating. And now, Cold these introduces new great tasting gummies that shorten your cold plus provide multi-symptom relief. They're great for the whole family. I'm Ted Carcass, CEO of Coldies. I guarantee Coldies will shorten your cold or your money back. No questions asked. Okay. So that's a little embarrassing, but it, it, it really drives home the point. Seriously, my family used to cringe when they saw that. And they're really going to cringe now because I'm developing a new product for malic acid. And they don't know I'm in the commercial and that's coming out next year. All right? So true story, too. You can look it up. Um, so that's my little marketing. But it doesn't have to have anything to do with TV commercials. It's how you reach people. If you reach out to them and say, do you have this problem? And then you provide a solution and explain how it works, it's incredibly effective. I'm sure there's other ways to reach people, but um, that's the way we did it. And obviously, the proof was in the $50 million that we sold for All right. Experience first. It's funny, Bruce said this to me when we were, when I was first introduced to him um, last month. Everybody likes to start a business, but you don't know anything. Seriously, you don't. If you start a business, odds are, listen, if you know what you're doing, odds are it's going to fail. If you don't know what you're doing, odds are really high that it's going to fail. So learn before you get your, you get burned, all right? Uh, perfect example, um, early on when I took over as CEO, I met a guy on an airplane who had just started Thrillist. His name is Ben Lehrer. Thrillist is an online magazine. What he did was brilliant. He befriended a private equity fund who had funded Daily Candy. Daily Candy is an online magazine for women. So what did he do? He did not reinvent the wheel. He took he went to the same private equity fund, learned from all the mistakes of Daily Candy, because Daily Candy had started up a couple of years earlier, learned everything they were doing, learned all about all of their mistakes, and so they started a couple of years ahead of where Daily Candy was without all of Daily Candy's mistakes. The private equity fund gave them like three or four hundred thousand dollars to start. They were profitable from day one. And I'm like, man, I want to invest in your company. I want to, he wouldn't take, he's the only person I ever met in all my years of uh, investing companies that would not take my money. I was like, let me just, it's like, can't do it, the private equity fund would give us money if we need it and we don't need it anymore. The point is, he didn't reinvent the wheel. He took a successful business model, he copied it, and Thrillist, you look it up, they're a hugely successful company now, they went out to make some other acquisitions and, and so on and so forth. I have another example, because I always thought about starting a pizzeria. In fact, I told a friend of mine in California that's struggling looking for a job, and I'm like, I'll help you. Go work in a pizzeria for three or six months, become a manager, learn everything about the business, and then go start your own. Why start from scratch before you know how to do it? My son, he is in Maryland. He's just going into his senior year. He did an internship in commercial real estate. He doesn't know, he thinks he might want to go into real estate development. He's not sure. He says, Jason, Look at the commercial real estate job as an experience that you can learn from, that maybe you'll work here when you graduate, maybe you won't, but learn from the experience and think about how you're going to apply this to what you want to do. So whatever you do as you're graduating or whatever business you're doing, whatever you're doing, think about it in terms of if you have a job and it's a part-time job, think about how you can learn about the business as opposed to just thinking of yourself as an employee that's working for a paycheck. Learn about the business in terms of how could you possibly 
build a similar business or a different business where you figure out what the strengths of the business are, but get experience first. The other thing about experience, um, and this is more, well, I'll get into the, in the lessons learned, but when you're raising money for your business, if you don't have experience, you're going to be really optimistic about what you're doing. But you're probably going to burn through the cash, and then you're not going to be able to go back to the same people that you just raised the money from, because now you've already raised the money, they've already seen that you weren't successful, why would they give you more money? If you have experience first, you'll make less mistakes, you won't be so quick to burn through the money and take it for granted. So, once you have the experience, thinking big. I thought big. Back when I didn't have a penny in my pocket, and the first time I got involved in the Quigley Corporation, and I started to do a little work with them, and I had no business asking for 25,000 options. That would have been a huge number of options for me. I negotiated, and they gave me 500,000 options, for which I made seven figures. I could ask for 25,000, I could ask for 50 ice for 500,000. These are two dollar options. I exercise them, I wrote them a check for a million dollars. I told them not to cash a check. Because I didn't have any money. They didn't know that. I probably shouldn't tell you that on tape, but it was 20 years ago. And I proceeded to sell the stock and raise the money and pay them back and made a profit on it. And they said I did such a good job of raising them a million dollars, because they couldn't raise a penny. And I just raised them the first million dollars. That they then gave me more long term warrants for which I made even more money. And that's what really set me off on my own path. Um, I thought big, and I, the reason I thought of that was I once read something, a little blurb, was a paragraph, where somebody said about thinking big, they said you could either be a real estate broker that rents an apartment, or you could sell a building or a shopping mall. The difference is mentality, maybe an extra couple of people working with you, working on a team, but what's the difference between somebody that hustles to rent an apartment and somebody that sells a shopping mall? It's mentality, it's about thinking big. It's up to you how successful you want to be. It's, it's about how you think about yourself and what you want to accomplish. I wasn't happy working almost, that's not this sort of a corollary to thinking big. I wasn't happy what I was doing, so I made a change. A lot of people, they're not happy in their jobs and they just continue to do it. I was driven, I don't know why, I was driven to find my place. I mentioned this already, don't take your partners and investors for granted. The product or service that you're going to be selling only accounts for a small part of the success of the business. I say this from experience of uh, being involved with hundreds of startup companies. The scientist, inventor, they always think they're geniuses, most of them probably are. They don't know anything about running businesses, and they think that because they're smart, they can also run the business. It takes several people with different strengths and weaknesses, as I mentioned before, in order to build a business. The product or service is a small part. You can have a great product. If you have lousy management, your business is not going to be successful. If you have an average product or service, but a really good management, you can go through the roof. So as I said, product or service equals 20%. Capital is huge. Don't think, and don't take the first capital you raise for granted because you may not be able to get a second round, particularly if you burn through that money and it, you haven't gotten to a certain level of success. Why would people give you more money? So that's what I have to say about experience first. And finally, love this. Life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. <laughs> when I was about, I don't know, 30 years old, I was like, oh my God, I'm getting so old. And somebody said to me, Ted, what are you worried about? Every 10 years, and he was older than I was, every 10 years your life gets better. I look forward to getting old. And you know what the funny thing is? Since the day he said that, absolutely every 10 years of my life has gotten better. By the same token, when you're 20 years old, 10 years is half your life. It seems like an, an enormous period of time. As time goes by, that 10 years goes by like that. So don't wait. I one control of the Quigley Corporation, which I turned, uh, changed the name to Prophase Office. That was the first job I ever had that I really loved. That was the first time that I was really passionate about what I was doing. I did that out of 50. I could have done that at 30. The only difference between 50 and 30 was mentality and direction and motivation. Proxy contest. The proxy contest is what got me there. And again, I'll talk to you about that in the Q&A if you like. And I already mentioned, don't take uh, the first capital you raise for granted. 
Those are some of the lessons learned. I can tell you a lot more. Why don't we do that in the Q&A? The bottom line of all this, this is fun for me to come here and talk to all of you. I haven't done this a bunch of times. I've actually only done this a couple of times before. I have a desire to do this more. Hopefully I'll get better at it over time. Um, I don't know where this is going to lead. My wife is like, you know, why are you doing this? And she's like, she leaves me alone to this is what I want to do. And this might lead to something, it might not. But this is something fun I'm doing on the side. I'm running my company, I'm involved in some other businesses. Believe me, my plate is full. But this is something that I wanted to do. In some ways it's similar to the people, my friends, and the network that I used to build in bringing people into the companies that I invested in. It's the only reason I was able to win the, the proxy contest. It's the only reason that I have the career I have now was because of the goodwill that I was building 25 years ago. And that goodwill, I didn't have an ulterior motive for building that goodwill. It's just something that I wanted to do. And this is very similar in coming to speak to you, all of you today. So I hope, please don't be shy about asking questions. I have a lot that I can share that I haven't even touched on. But it's up to you. If you want to get more out of me, this is the time to do it. That's an opportunity for you. Uh, I'll, I'll simply point out Malachi and Eugene, they get it. I'm sitting here with Professor Bockenheimer Bruce. And the first thing they did when they saw me is they came right over to introduce themselves. Nobody told them to do it. They made the effort to do it. When I was their age, I wouldn't have done it. In fact, when I was at your age, I probably wouldn't have even come to an event like this. So you made the right step by coming here today. I hope some of you, something clicked with some of you with something that I said today, because if you did, that'll make me feel really good. So with that, um, I think that's the last slide. And like I said, it goes by fast. That was, in my mind, not long ago. I mean, that was 1981. And here I am ringing, you know, ringing the bell on, on NASDAQ, um, which, you know, frankly, anybody that's a public company, if you ask, they'll probably let you ring it. Um, but I went from there to there, kind of by accident. I was the accidental entrepreneur, but I had a drive and I had a motivation to do it, and I, I pushed myself to do it the same way I'm here today. So thank you so much. So thank you to, to Ted.